Welcome to the Million Vegan Grandmothers podcast. And I have Isabella. And Isabella is going to be on our next convergence called See a Change that's coming up October 28th and 29th. So don't miss it under climatehealers.org. But Isabella is an incredible artist. And we know that a lot of what we do and see and change through the world is through the creative process of creating art. We're actually going to be doing a presentation on the convergence called the art of veganism, because to do veganism well, and I'm not just talking about the food, but to really settle into it and then to find space between the overwhelm is an art. It's a creative art. And I do believe art is an amazing way for us to move through and be able to express ourselves without letting some of it overwhelm us. So Isabella, take it away. Tell us a little bit about what you've done in the past and where you're going and your vision. Thank you for being here. Um, Well, thank you for having me, Tammy. And um, so I think you asked about my academic background. Um, I have, a BA in fine arts and an MFA in in photography. I taught for 30 years on the college level. I taught art and photography and multimedia art. And uh, two years ago, I left academia Mm -hmm. um, and just to work, to do my own work. Um, And the big project that I've been working on since 2012 is uh, called Censored Landscapes. It's a um, photography and text project. Um, It started with, you may have heard about this, in Turlock, California, uh, 50,000 hens were abandoned in a battery cage facility. Mm -hmm. They were left to starve. Um, And I went and photographed the facility after it had been abandoned. And that launched the project, I started photographing all sorts of um, sites of animal agriculture. I photographed feedlots and slaughterhouses and, you know, auction houses. And um, I also photographed animals who were either on these facilities or had been rescued from those facilities. And um, I also um, contextualized these images because out of context, it's difficult to understand the depth and breadth of this um, atrocity, really it's an atrocity. Mm. Um, So the um, project entails a lot of research, research about the the effect on the animals, the effect on workers, the effect on the environment, um, the effect on human health of animal agriculture. And it also includes um, creative nonfiction, A lot of it, which I wrote, um, poetry written by several other people. There's a piece in there by Patrice Jones, who's just an amazing, great activist. Um, So that was that's the project. It's now 11 years since I started it. Um, In addition, I um, researched the number of animals who were imprisoned in the facilities. Um, because, you know, all you see are warehouses. In many cases, unless they're dairy farms or feedlots, you don't even see the animals. They just look like big warehouses in the middle of nowhere. And um, so I wanted to represent the animals in some way who were in these places. So I found out the number of animals um, on each of those facilities. Um, Sometimes I did have to get industry uh, experts to give me estimates because in some places they're not even regulated. They or they're regulated by um, animal units, which are um, I think a thousand pounds of animal basically. Like they don't, they're not even individuals at all. Um, so uh, that book is coming out next year, and um, that has consumed me, especially since I was teaching a lot of the time that I was working on that. Um, Tell us the name of the book again. Censored Landscapes. Censored Censored Landscapes. Landscapes. Yeah, yeah. Perfect title. Yeah, well, as you know, um, 
I'm not sure in Canada, but in the United States, half of U.S. state legislatures have attempted to pass ag-gag laws. And these laws um, criminalize photographing sites of animal agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, And they are unconstitutional. You know, they're against the First Amendment of the of the United States Constitution, they are still in effect in six states. And there are states still attempting to pass these laws. Um, There's also the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which is a federal law. You know, the other, the ag-gag laws are state laws. Uh, The federal law is the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, which basically makes it uh, an act of terrorism to interfere with the profits of an animal enterprise. So um, these landscapes are in fact censored. I did very little that was illegal. They are landscapes. I didn't break in. I didn't, um, I didn't do, um, you know, uh, rescues. I, I am in great awe of everyone who does that. And, um, but I don't have the heart. I do not have the heart to do that. Just witnessing what I witnessed on the level that I did required a lot of emotional centering um, to just deal with, you know, the sounds I heard, the animals I saw. I don't have, I don't have the the emotional fiber (laughs) to, to break into these places and witness more than what I witnessed. Um, So all that is to say, I didn't break laws. I didn't, um, mostly I didn't trespass. (laughs) And um, I photographed a lot of the animals that I photographed in um, sanctuaries, animal sanctuaries, which as you know, are the backbone in a lot of ways of the animal rights movement. You know, this is where People have the opportunity to, well, animals have the opportunity to live their lives free and um, without violence and, you know, the way all animals should. Um, And they are also places where people can understand what animals, especially farmed animals, but, you know, there are all sorts of animal sanctuaries are really like, you know, that they're not commodities, that they have families and emotions and desires, and they do not wish to die. And they, um, more than anything, they suffer. And they have um, feelings, they are sentient. Mm -hmm. Um, So I was really grateful to the animal sanctuaries who opened their doors to me and allowed me to spend time with their animals. so that's censored landscapes and it's been a big project and it's still going on, you know, I'm working on the book, um, getting it designed and all that. Um, I'm also working on a, a project entitled Ofrendas. Ofrendas um, is a ritual in Mexico. It's part of the kind of day of the dead ceremonies. Mm-hmm. Um, ofrendas actually translated means offering. And this project started because I um, I live in a rural area, and I'm as as we were talking about earlier, I, I walk every day, and ah, it's just so awful the number of animals I see dead, left dead on the road. You know, um, they're either hit by cars or they're, um, you know, just hunted or just pure cruelty. You know, people can be very cruel, and um, you know, at first I I just you know, it's heartbreaking. And I would just, I carried around gloves with me and I'd take them off the road and, and then I started photographing them. And then I decided, well, I want to offer something more beautiful to these animals than this, you know, unlovely situation in which they died, violent, horrible, they're left on the road for more indignity. So I photograph them and then I create a new environment for them. I, I use watercolor and I use pastel and I just kind of create a whole new environment for their, for the photographs of their bodies. Um, so that, that I've been working on lately. 
Um, those are the two that are most connected to my um, to my feelings about um, non-human animals. You know, which which like you, I'm vegan, been vegan for a long time, and um, I just it's beyond belief. <laughs> you know, it's beyond belief, as you probably have felt too that that our culture continues this you know mass atrocity of trillions of animals you know every year um so those are the two projects i have other i'm always working on a million projects but um those are the two most connected to my feelings and my work about you know my activism uh for non-human animals yeah well thank you for doing that i'm very moved that you're doing these you know, these beautiful scapes around these animals that have been killed and turned into almost like this beautiful aura around them, who they really were. It's, it's almost like presenting them who they really were when they were still alive. So that's beautiful. I'm an artist also. And and I love how you can just take a, a white page and create something. It, it always creates uh, something really interesting in me. It's usually trees for me. I'm very, very connected to the trees since I was a little girl and and um, and the birds. And I noticed mm -hmm. the birds are disappearing. When I was interviewing Captain Paul Watson, he was saying the insects are disappearing really rapidly. And I thought about that and I thought, I haven't seen a ladybug this year. Mm -hmm. Even since my grandkids have been born, they're four and six, we used to see lots under leaves even a few years ago. I haven't seen one ladybug this year. Mm -hmm. So... No wonder the birds are disappearing. They yeah. just don't seem as abundant, you know. So it's it's through the whole food chain that, you know, when when we destroy one environment and even, even living in a world where we're called terrorists for trying to awaken the the uncensored uncensored landscapes, you know, it's a very big movement towards awakening that we're in right now so do you see us picking up ground in this area that we are awakening as a species into what my friend judy carmen would call homo ahimsas one of the grandmothers homo ahimsas who we really are mm -hmm. well I, that's a good question i i see it moving in two different directions mm -hmm. you know on the one hand you know, when I became vegan, <laughs> vegan options were not, you know, <laughs> you know, the word vegan was most people, many people didn't even know what it meant, you know, and, you know, people would be like, well, you know, it's got, it's got um, yeast in it. <laughs> it's like, well, yeast is not, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, that's the, the level of ignorance to, to what even what an animal food animal was. And yeah. now, as you know, it's, you know, there are vegan products and the word, you know, fast food restaurants are serving plant-based options. Um, and I think many, many more people are aware of the atrocity that is animal agriculture. And when I say animal agriculture, you know, I, I just want to emphasize that it is not just limited to food animals, like what you pointed out about the insects, you know, and the wildlife, it affects every facet of life. Um, so I see that direction, you know, I see more people being aware, but at the same time, um, meat consumption is higher than it ever was in the United States. So, and, you know, in, in countries where meat was not traditionally consumed, which is in most countries, you know, meat is not in many places, a traditional part of the diet in those countries mean consumption is way up and it's yeah. kind of almost a, a status symbol and it's you know kind of becoming developed uh is it's part of becoming developed or a developed country so i don't know i'm not sure i'm um i consider myself a realist in that i want to see things as they really are um and uh those two facts you know that that there's more awareness around veganism but there's an increase in the consumption of animals. Um, I hold them both in my mind at the same time. And I cannot tell you, you know, uh, 
what what that means in terms of a trend. Right. Well, we do know there's more vegans in the world. Oh, yeah. We know that quite a bit. And even since 2020. Yeah. A lot of people did a lot more research on a lot of different things when they were told how to behave and, and, you know, what freedoms they had. And a lot of people push back on that, very frustrated. But I love what Dr. Will Tuttle says, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if love's the right word, but I appreciate deeply what Dr. Will Tuttle says is that everything we've done to animals is going to eventually come back to humans. I mean, it has to, there's, there's a circle in life and there's, there's a karmic effect. And so that's what we're seeing, you know, when we're, when we're put in situations where um, our guts are so dysbiotic from the way that we partake on the planet the way we treat the planet that we can't fight off viruses very easily and then we get these super viruses and yeah so not to mention climate change i mean we're already seeing it and um you know the, the, the wildfires the droughts the flooding the sea level rise the melting glaciers a lot of that has to do with animal agriculture um, you know, animal culture is animal agriculture is a leading cause, mm-hmm. uh, not only climate change, but loss of biodiversity, um, you know, mass species extinction. It's it's directly causing <laughs> these these catastrophes. So um, it, I think he's right. Dr. Tuttle is right when he says it's coming back to bite us in the butt. And, um, you know, I. I think you're right. There's more vegans um, there, and you know, hopefully people are going to wake up sooner rather than later. Yeah. Well, in the cycle of change, the chaos is just before the actual shift. And that's what I feel like we're actually in right now. You know, like that saying things change very, very slowly and then they change all at once. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we're in the middle of. And I think there's a lot of pushback from the industry that has had a stronghold on a sick care system for a very long time, sick care for the entire planet. Mm -hmm. As I wrote in my book, Earth Gut, you know, what we experience in our gut, which is the epicenter of our health, is exactly connected to the earth that we partake in. And so we're either praising her and and eating this microbial rich food from living soil or we're poisoning her and we sometimes don't have a choice on even whether our food is poisoned if we're next to a place that is is deeply poisoning but when we do once we know you know we must do right i was i was listening to a beautiful speaker on a mental health conference that i'm in right now online and they were he was describing the difference between empathy and compassion and in a book that my partner and I are writing right now you know the second stage is empathy but I think I need to change it to compassion after he explained this he said empathy is that you can really empathize you can really feel what's going on but compassion is when you empathize so deeply that you want to stop the suffering that you want to intervene to stop the suffering, however that looks. So you're doing that with your incredible art and gathering community together. And I'm I'm sure that you shared some of this knowledge of what is really going on in as a professor, as a teacher. Oh, well, you know, there there's a lot of limits as to what you can do as an art teacher, mm-hmm. um, especially in universities. Um, it it was peripheral to my teaching most of the time, just because, you know, there's only so much time and there's things that they need to learn. And some students um, react badly when they feel that they're being in any way um, brainwashed or uh, that's the word they use Um, or, you know, anything that's not, directly connected um especially here you know i'm in the south i'm in the american south yeah um and you know there's there's a whole um kind of i don't know how to put it whole belief that 
the academic system is there to brainwash your children and that um, to, or politicize them in a certain way. You've probably heard about, you know, all of the kind of um, rhetoric about, you know, um, critical race theory and um, just trying to ban books um, because there are people who feel that they want to have control of the narrative. And if, you know, you're not pushing their narrative, you can get a lot of flack, um, you know, so, um, and in the last college where I taught, a lot of my peer, my, a lot of my reviews were based on student evaluations. Mm -hmm. In fact, 100%. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I was in a position where I had to be very careful about anything that could be construed as, construed as politicizing my classes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is my work. So um, when I was in a position to show my work, of course, that, that had some influence. And I'm quite certain just showing up as who you are, Isabella, would, would change people's lives. You're fully embodied in the truth of alleviating suffering. Mm -hmm. And I, we were talking about this in a gathering recently with uh, the grandmothers and saying that, you know, truly, if, because we're coming to International Day of Peace, which is September 21st at the equinox. And part of that came about through a bunch of meditators showing up in really high violent cities. They're talking more about human crime. Mm -hmm. um, it would be interesting to know if people ate less flesh food and secretions at that time. But they noticed the crime rate dropped quite significantly while the meditators were there praying for peace and nonviolence. And I believe that that's what we're here for is just to show up and then everything else is a bonus, how we how we share our our art and to remain. It's almost like it's our job to remain joyful to some level, because how can we convince people this is a really great life? It's it's already liberation. Mm hmm. It's already liberation to step out of that whole piece. Mm -hmm. Even if we have feelings sometimes of overwhelmed, sad or disappointment, we're already liberated to some degree. Mm -hmm. And so then it's just really truly holding space for other people to wake up. Mm -hmm. And I think it's our job. I think it's our vision as as elder as women that are maturing and becoming wiser to say hey this feels good it's not only so i i believe there's been a lot of different vegan activism and i think sometimes people have been pretty you know in people's face and i don't think there's anything wrong with that but i think it's really moved to a very compassionate way of being for the most part, you know, even the cubes are just showing things. Most of the people are silent until people approach them just saying, this is what it looks like. This is mm -hmm. where your, this is where your, your food is coming from your food. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was, um, I was putting my grandchildren to bed the other day and my granddaughter wanted a creepy story. Her dad tells her like these creepy stories. <laughs> like I just guess, you know, like, you know, that kind of stuff. So I started telling her a creepy story of this beautiful, beautiful rainforest that was getting cut down by these big machines mm -hmm. and these chains and all these animals were, and the monkeys and, and, you know, all of the animals on the forest floor and all the insects and were running, trying to find another forest, but they were, the whole forest was being cut down and, and, and they couldn't find their mothers or their brothers or their sisters or their, and, my granddaughter's four. And I said, the reason why they were cutting down these forests is so they could put cows there so they could eat grass and people could eat the cows. And she just looked at me and she said, oh, that's why you're vegan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So they understand, they understand. And even though my, my grandchildren are not being raised vegan yet, it's just to keep telling the story, telling it through photography, telling it through art, telling it through words, telling it through poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really all about the art, the art of bringing it forward. And that's why I'm so impressed and, and really moved by other, other wise women artists. Mm -hmm. You were talking about a poem that's in your book. I wondered if that would be too inconvenient right now for you to be able to find that poem and read it for us. Um, this isn't exactly a book, <laughs> but um, this is, it's sort of, sort of creative nonfiction. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to read you this because it's kind of the basis for my spiritual connection. Um, I would love that. It's it's a little longer than a poem. Um, it probably That's great. Would, is that okay? Yes. Okay. We're all about the art here. The art of veganism. Oh, I, okay. I should, I should um, preface this um, this is meant to go with a photograph of a hen named Kelsey. And Kelsey was rescued from that facility that I talked about previously, where 50,000 hens were abandoned. She was mm -hmm. one of the hens in one of those battery cages. So mm -hmm. I photographed Kelsey. And um, so she inspired me to write this. Um, mm -hmm. And it's called Connection. Um Okay. I've named it the dreadful, dreaded dread, like seaweed that's always present, but mostly appears at low tide. The DDD emerges, emerges at 2.28 a.m. or 3.47 a.m. or 4.13 a.m. No one else is, I know is awake. There's no one to call. Full moon or new moon, starry sky or starless, it doesn't matter. I try to slow my breath, but it rushes ahead. The more control I attempt, the less tranquil I am. Practice equanimity, I tell myself, detach. But no, it creeps into my guts, in my joints, in my synapses, in the crazed beating of my heart. The DDD will not be lulled or dismissed. It is splendidly amorphous and ingeniously antsy. The infrastructure for the DDD is my DNA. My father was nine years old when he was orphaned in World War II. His family had been grievously poor. The war flung him and his siblings into greater poverty. More trauma ensued. When I was growing up, my dad suffered night terrors that ripped his sleep apart. I'd awaken to him yelling in the other room, terrified. Epigenetic intergenerational trauma, trauma that leaves a mark on one's genes. Future generations inherit it. I likely inherited it. Like black flies on sticky tape curling down from the ceiling, all sorts of worries adhere to the DDD. A partial list in no particular order, bed bugs, incontinence, bioterrorist attacks, dementia, homelessness, incontinence and dementia while homeless, infestations of invasive insects, plastics, plastic in the ocean, microplastics, tornadoes, fossil fuels, global warming, monocultures, dying pollinators, endangered wildlife, animal agriculture, environmental collapse. And then the one that transcends even death, terror of being all alone in an indifferent universe. Out there, beyond Earth's atmosphere, swirls of mess of gases and masses and particles and black holes. In that unfathomable and impersonal vacuum, our most sublime experiences and values, beauty, joy, kindness, empathy, altruism, love, are mere abstractions. What if our noblest ideals are nothing but social constructs, more human invention that feeds a delusion that life is not meaningless or futile, just humans strutting and fretting, sound and fury in a tale told by an idiot, signifying nothing. I suppose for some people, religion provides reassurance. I have piled my plate high from an all-you-can-eat buffet of religious beliefs and practices. What I'm left with is that I do not have the kind of faith required for most religions. I cannot take it on faith that, qual that the qualities I hold dearest exist beyond human constructs, that we are not alone. I need evidence. The morning light tends to wither the dreadful dreaded dread. 
Sunshine and emotion are linked. Sunlight increases serotonin levels. Light refracts into rainbows and suffuses the world with color. Under optimum conditions, humans see a range of light from violet to red. Bees, for example, and butterflies also perceive ultraviolet light. The visible light spectrum for chickens includes all the colors of human vision plus ultraviolet and infrared. But sunlight is not efficient in the production of eggs for human consumption. In the warehouses where hens like Kelsey are imprisoned, artificial light is alternated with periods of darkness to stimulate maximum egg laying. This for an animal whose perception of light is richer than that of humans. Chickens and humans are much more the same than we are different. Chickens and humans share more than half our genes, a genome more elemental than the epigenetic tra trauma I may have inherited. Sentience, the capacity to experience feelings, connects humans with birds, with fishes, with mammals. Chickens recognize beauty, protect their young, and exhibit empathy. A rooster signals danger from predators with various calls depending on the threat. If he finds a yummy morsel, he broadcasts to others. Anyone who has seen baby goats together cannot doubt they are jumping with joy. Stressed fish seek out caresses even from robot fish. The cow bellows and is beaten back as her calf is dragged away bleeding. Is this not love? Humans are not isolated in our own little love bubble. I've known this when I was, since I was a kid. Most kids know this. I would gaze into the magnificently lashed chocolate eyes of the horse who grazed in a field near my house. We meet up at the fence any time I walked by. She loved when I stroked her coat and cooed at her. I loved when she nuzzled me and blew at me from her nostrils. When we were together, oxytocin, the love hormone in mammals, surged for both of us. When falling in love, when playing with the dog or cuddling with the cat, when a mom breastfeeds her baby, oxytocin is doing its thing. In other animals, oxytocin has its counterpart, isotocin in fishes, mesotocin in birds and reptiles. The existential fear of being all alone in an indifferent universe is an illusion, a squalid cage erected by the human mind. We, all animals, are made from stars. We are of the earth and the earth is of the universe, a truth so absolute as to be trite. The line drawn between human and non-human is make-believe. Every sentient animal on earth is connected by DNA and stardust and goodness and love, evidence that we are not alone. Wow, thank you for that. Thank you. Is that a piece I wrote in Uncensored Landscapes? That's in the book. That will be in the book, Censored Landscapes, yes. Censored Landscapes, right. Thank you. I guess I'm just wishing ahead. Wishing ahead, yes. Wishing ahead. That was very moving and deep and powerful and connecting. Connecting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And giving the readers a landscape, a landscape of both the feeling of what that animal misses out on and, and also the scientific understanding of what that animal is capable of, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. what that being is capable of and takes it away from this human centric superiority, which is so not true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did that beautiful chicken get rescued? Yes. Yeah. I photo the photograph is was taken at an animal sanctuary. That's yeah, four thousand four hundred and I think it's sixty-seven of the hens were rescued. First, first they came in. The state officials came in and started gassing them, um, and then animal sanctuaries negotiated. You know, while this was going on, to try to rescue some of them, and finally. Uh, mm -hmm. Over four thousand four hundred were were rescued, and mm -hmm. Kelsey was one of 
was one of them. And I photographed her at Harvest Home Animal at Sanctuary, um, which is a, a just heavenly place. And where is it located? It's in um, Stockton, California. Okay, great. Will you be doing any art therapy for vegans in the future? Or do you do that now? Um, I have no background in, in art therapy. Um, oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Just being I mean, an I'd love to. Be an artist. <laughs> being close to your heart and being an artist, you're completely trained for art therapy for uh, vegans. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, that would be that would be great. I'm in a it would be difficult for me to do that um, in person because mm -hmm. I think I may be the only vegan for 35 months. <laughs> so so um, I don't think there are very many vegans around here who need, who need art therapy because there aren't any vegans. Um, so, um, yeah, Central Kentucky is not known for its vegan culture. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm quite aware. I know quite a few. I have a few friends in Kentucky. Do you? Um, yeah, and they're pretty heavy. They I met them at wellness centers, actually vegan wellness centers, but they went right back to a meat centric diet. So, oh, that's that's what happens. That's what people. That's what people do. Um, we're very, we're very resilient, and resiliency can be such a gift, but but it can also be such a curse. We had this resiliency to um, forget quite easily if we're not surrounded. And I think an art therapy online would just be an amazing way to start with mm -hmm. the community. I think it would be a, a great way to move through trauma and grief because well, it, actually, it, I art is very to... present. Oh, sorry, I interrupted yeah, you. No, I said for art, it, it just brings me to the present for myself. And I, I hear that with other people and I see it. I see it in my grandchildren when I do art with them or they're just really totally present. Yeah. I've actually done some online workshops where I, um, I use photography using your phone um, as a meditative practice uh, yes. because when you're really, you know, when you're really photographing, you're no longer ego you're no longer separate. You you really at best you are almost you become one with your surroundings, and mm -hmm. you start to channel your surroundings into this vision that you have. Um, so it's a, it's a very very med meditative. It has a history of being a meditative practice, and since we all have phones now, it's you know it's very accessible. Um, so I've done that. It's not specifically for vegans, but it it does bring you into the present moment. You know. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for this time, Isabella. Do you have one other little piece you would like to read as a closing? Oh gosh, they're all so long. I don't know if I, um, I don't know if I, let me see if I can find the shortest one. Um, sorry, I closed that window. Oh no, here it is. going to try to find the shortest one um such a gift for us to be able to hear you uh in your spoken word because uh you're there that's you're in the middle of it you're in the middle of your your dharma mm -hmm. oh well thank you i i, I know you are too that's mm -hmm. why it's so important for people like us to have a conversation mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I think the shortest one is actually about um, fishes, and especially since the convergence is around water, I think this might be of interest. Of interest. Um, okay, great. And if any of our listeners are are listening, because we will close after this, uh, any of our listeners are listening. <laughs> if any of our <laughs> listeners want to come to the convergence or truly listening, I'm just reading a book called 10,000 Ways to Listen. Uh, by Mark Nepo, and it's it's really interesting how how difficult it is for most people to truly listen. So, if our listeners are deeply listening, and they want to join us at the convergence, October twenty eighth and 29th, you can go onto climatehealers.org and go under VCOB, and Isabella will be presenting. And it's called Sea of Change. And how do people reach you, Isabella? Oh, um, I can give you my email address. You can also go to my website, 
um, which is, um, it's pretty easy to remember. It's just www.glissi, G-L-I-S-S-I dot org. It's an org and not a com. Um, so, and I think if you Google me, uh, Isabel LaRocca Gonzalez, that's one of the first things that comes up is my website. So, um, great. That and that website will be in the link and on the YouTube after great. this comes, uh, forward and thank you. Yes. And let's hear about fishes. Oh, I'm trying to find it. I'm sorry. It's taking me a moment. Um, there's okay. a lot of fishes and, um, okay. This- I kind of put you on the spot here. Ah, here we go. Okay, I found it. Um, So the name of this is um, ET Phone Home. Um, I know most people know what that's referring to, the movie, The Extraterrestrial. Um, ET Phone Home. I've had contact with extraterrestrials, excuse me, extraterrestrials. No, I'm not a kook. They are complex creatures sometimes repulsive to homo sapiens, but sublime even to the limited perceptions of the human eye. Their senses are often more developed and acute than those of humans. They communicate with sophisticated vibrations humans are incapable of understanding. They are intelligent beings. When I was younger, I contributed to their mass slaughter. I deeply regret this. ETs feel pain and my actions caused immeasurable suffering. The torment continues. Humans imprison them, breed them, farm them, and slaughter them with impunity, with glee even. Humans kill at least a trillion ETs every year. Some humans boil them alive. Some humans eat them alive. Humans, usually men, bait them with lures on hooks that pierce their flesh for sport. The sportsmen bond with their children over this pastime. Women who pursue this activity are touted as feminist icons. The SETI, SETI Institute, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, is a nonprofit organization founded in 1984. Great minds have devoted themselves to, and millions of dollars have been spent on this kind of research. In 2020, the SETI Institute helped establish the Earthling Project to create a composition of 10,000 voices representing the sounds of humanity that will be sent to outer space. Meanwhile, the sounds of humanity are ruining extraterrestrial habitats. Boats, ships, motors, sonar, and offshore blasting disrupt ET's ability to communicate, to find food or mates, and to avoid predators, causing trauma or death. The industries of humanity are destroying extraterrestrial habitats. At least 14 million tons of plastic every year end up in their home. It poisons them. It chokes them. It causes starvation. Agricultural runoff containing pesticides, fertilizers, and farmed farmed animal feces produce harmful algal blooms and marine dead zones. Farmed ETs infect wild ETs with lethal diseases. Humans long ago encountered extraterrestrial intelligence. The consequences have been tragic. Note, extraterrestrial originates from the Latin extraterrestris, which means outside of soil, land, ground, or earth. Dear extraterrestrial beings, beware of homo sapiens from planet earth. Danger, danger. Thank you, Isabella. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. It just, it stuns me that people are concerned about finding extraterrestrial life when we found it long ago and we do not respect it. Mm. Do not respect it. Um, So hopefully people will start to see extraterrestrial life in a more inclusive way. It's beautiful food for thought. I mean... Not the food, <laughs> but yeah, thought food. Because I had never um, thought of our our ocean life, our river life, our our lake life like that. So thank you again for your time. Well, thank you very much, Tammy, and thank you for everything you're doing. And um, I will see you again soon. I'm sure paths will, will, will cross. Yes. 
October 28th and 29th, for sure. Thank sure. you.